Dennis Prager here. In my studio is one of the most interesting people in the United States of America. In fact, I would even go further in North America. Eh, Western Hemisphere. <laughs> Your wife, Susan. <laughs> That's true, too. Okay, this is a problem, my friends, because you understand that when Ann Coulter comes to town, the highlight of her visit is seeing my wife. True. Who who drags me along to lunch? <laughs> All right, bring your husband. That's fine. But the, but the the real thing is to bring Sue. Ann Coulter is one of the handful of people who doesn't need an introduction, and that's the truth. She is that well known. Uh, let me let me say a few words about you uh, because it's I'm asked about you you know okay, more than occasionally. I I have said because I believe it. She is brilliant. But brilliance doesn't matter if it's not in the use of good values. Do I agree with her on everything? It's so irrelevant. I don't agree with my wife on everything. I don't agree with me on everything. I don't agree (laughs) with the living martyr on everything. It's such a silly question. Do you agree on everything? Is, Is the net result of Ann Coulter's work a better America? Yes, it is. Okay? Simple as that. Plus, her books are brilliant. And I just want to add this. It is a scandal. It is an intellectual scandal that the New York Times does not review them or the Washington Post or the LA Times or NPR. It is like Tom Sowell. Tom Sowell, who is arguably the most brilliant economist after, um, who's who's our hero? Uh, Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman. The most brilliant, but not just economist. The man is just brilliant in, in every arena. He I bet you 95% of left-wing intellectuals never heard of him. Mm-hmm. That's a scandal. Mm-hmm. So, uh, by the Oberman, way, we heard of all of them. Keith Oberman you denounced him once, calling him Thomas Sowell. <laughs> and I thought, you really? fake phony fraud. Oh my you God. can't even well, get the guy's name right. right. Okay, well, then uh, who, who, who said that? Um, Keith Oberman. Keith Oberman. You're who, so who, lucky. Who is, I'm a hate watcher. I Keith, know everything. Is he Keith said. Oberman still doing anything? <laughs> oh no, 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 no. Okay, fine. He's home with his cat. All right, that's beautiful. House slippers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you see, Ed Coulter. She, she. You're a firebrand. Is that fair to say? I like that one. I know. No, no clue. But, but you. But please, my friends, her books are so important and fully annotated. Fully. There isn't one fact said without a footnote, just so you'll know. What was your last book? Resistance is Futile, How the Trump-Hating Left Lost Its Collective Mind. And it really is all you need to know for the next two years, because if you are a hate watcher like I am, it's the exact same stories coming up over. I, everybody always wants me to have a TV show. I have no interest in a TV show. Um, but I did think of one episode. Um, it would be me and a studio audience, and I'd show like last night's Rachel Maddow show or clips from it and have the studio audience guess is this last night's show or is it October 2017? <laughs> That's brilliant. Or is it January 2018? It never right. changes. That's such a great point. <laughs> and you know, you were just saying before we went on air, and I completely agree with you, and most people listening to this would think we're nuts, don't really care that much about politics. But I'm with you. It's the larger picture. Mm-hmm. And that is a lot of the problem. And I love our side, and I'm glad they're out fighting. But that's a lot of the problem with the response to the to the Russia nonsense. They get down in the weeds with what McCabe said to whom and who Bruce Orr is. That's not resistance is futile. No, each scandal, it's like a motion to dismiss I'm making on each one of the scandals. Even if everything they say is true, <laughs> you haven't given us a scandal. Well, that's the that's right. We're inundated with trivia. Yes. Yes, and people get into it and gives them something to talk about on TV, both our side and their side. Right. But for normal people, I promise you, you don't need to know who Bruce Orr is. Why would a man who was in the pocket of Vladimir Putin tell Germany you better not rely on Russia for your uh, for your uh, energy needs? Right. Right. Why and- would he supply Ukraine with lethal weapons? And moreover, I mean, one of the things, we don't want to waste much time on Russia, but one of the things that that I think is being completely missed in this, of the promises Trump made, of the things that set him apart from every other candidate, 
One of them was that he wanted better relationship with Russia. It was Carly Fiorina. It was it was George Pataki saying, you know, I would supply Ukraine with lethal we- weapons. And remember, Carly was going to move like our battleships around. OK, those candidates lost. Trump won promising better relationship with Russia. But now he's sort of been forced by the media into being much more aggressive toward Russia. And it's not the Soviet Union anymore. Reagan won. It's over. It's no more corrupt than half of our, you know, lovely allies like there Saudi was, Arabia. I was listening to NPR and, oh, it kills me. I don't remember <laughs> who said it. Either it was a Democratic politician or an NPR obs- uh, commentator that Russia is an existential threat. That's the word. <laughs> they love existential. They love Global that. warming's existential. Right. So many existential threats. It's amazing our existence continues. <laughs> Russia the, is not an existential threat. Except the actual existential threat, the fact that we have no borders. Okay, that's, let's get we're going to go to that. That's, because, not, yeah, that's your passion and you you have been right as usual by the way on that fact. Let me just review what I was talking about at the end of the last yes. uh, the last at the hour. Uh, I have never found data so difficult to find uh, in all of my career mm-hmm. as data on the amount of crime committed by illegal immigrants. A, is it my a faulty research or B, is it correct? And if so, why? Um, you, you may not remember this, but your, your parent company, my parent company, Salem Regnery, that published Adios America, I was writing a completely different book. Immigration was going to be, I don't like focusing on single topics. I like a broad overview, like treason. And I got a lot in on Joe McCarthy in my book, Treason. Well, for the book I was writing, which actually I've never written, it seems like kind of a good idea for a book, as soon as we save the country. Um, For Adios America, I forget what the title was going to be, but it was a completely different book. I had already written a couple of chapters. I get to the immigration chapter, and that's what I start looking up. How many immigrants are in prison, state, both legal and illegal? Oh, okay, both. I want them both. Right. Because the government is inviting these Somalis in. Can I get their track record? Um, So uh, also state, um, federal, what crimes have they committed? Um... And I spent two weeks, and I'm a fanatical researcher. And I, w- I'm, I just gave up in frustration and rage, and I called up Margie, and I said... Of Regnery. Uh, of Regnery, I got a new book. I have just uncovered the most massive conspiracy. I mean, you would think that people arguing about it, you know, Cato Institute versus whoever, whomever was on our side on the issue, and there aren't many, um, or, you know, this or that government report, I could find, as I just... I, chapter 7, I think, describes... The process I went through and what you end up finding, you finally think you've got a report on, you know, some small aspect of it. I mean, just something like how many Hispanics are in prison. The only (laughs) or, you know, prison population by by ethnicity and race. You read it and think, oh, my gosh, I finally have it. And then there's a little asterisk at the bottom saying um, for every year except, um, you know, 1920, uh, Hispanics are counted as white. Well, thank you for that government. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, this is one of my complaints, and they're legion, uh, with Donald Trump. Why hasn't he put John Lott in charge of the um, Bureau of Justice Statistics? You were just saying this would be a good cause to fund. John Lott should be funded to do this. He could do the same thing for immigration that he did to guns. But there's no private money to fund it because I, why? I, there's – well, I mean, we saw it <sighs> – We've been seeing it now that people are paying attention basically since Trump has been elected. I have never seen an issue where all of the elites are so hysterically Mm -hmm. on the same side. And Trump knew this. I mean, he should have known it from his campaign. It is the donors. It's the Koch brothers. It's Cato Institute. Frankly, it's Heritage Foundation. It is both the left and the right. It is the establishment Republicans. It's the establishment Democrats. And the fact that they can produce, I mean, there are many examples, produce this bill and even present it to Trump for his signature. I, I mean, they talk about Trump being the madman. They are the madmen with the grenade saying, we're just going to blow this country up and we don't care. We want the cheap labor and the Democrats want the votes. Usually people are passionate, this level of passion for something like going to war or not going to war or or civil rights. This is for we want 
we're sharks. We have no brain, but we have a huge appetite, and we just want to keep the cheap labor flowing. When you have Mike Lee on the same side, and even Tom Cotton fell this with this last bill, um, increasing all the H one one B workers, John Thune increasing all the H B two workers, which and sales don't really matter, but just dumping more and more cheap labor on the country while they're pretending they care about the American people. No, they don't. That was powerful. So that explains, among other things, I'm going to get back to the obfuscation of the data because I have a, I have a, a theory, and I don't know if it's accurate, but that explains the Cato Institute report, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's Koch Brothers. Back in a moment with Ann Coulter. I'm Dennis Prager. The Dennis Prager Show. Because I'll be gone. All right, everybody, Dennis Prager here with one of the scintillating minds in the United States, Ann Coulter. And I, uh, we're talking about, we're going to talk about a lot of things, but this, this is new to me. The almost impossibility of getting statistics on the percentage of crimes or the simply amount of crimes committed by illegal immigrants in the United States or illegal aliens. What, what this guy was just saying, it, I mean, it shows California is the vanguard for the rest of the country. They do it first. This was the first state to be ruined by illegal and, and overwhelming legal immigration. But there, there are two things I, want, I would like to highlight. One is, you said this, but I, it's so important, I, it needs to be raised and have people remember it. Which side wants the actual numbers? It's not that, theirs. That's a good one. That's a good one. So they keep right. arguing, Cato, yes. when I stumbled upon this and I'm looking at the debates, our side just kept arguing about, well, we, we're looking at this other, you know, we, we, we've counted up this or that or this other thing to try to get this vague estimate. And then, oh, but we know exactly how many Samoans have battery powered radios. The Census Bureau collects that information. These are people who are coming in contact with government officials throughout their stay in the, in the federal and state prison system. How about we count? How about that's all we need? And I noticed that my side is the only one who keep the only side that keeps saying, let's find out instead of arguing about our impressionistic. And the other thing that that leads to is the GAO numbers that Sue was just talking about. Um, I go through about 10 things they leave out to underestimate the number of immigrants in prison, um, like the one I just mentioned. For one thing, the state figures, I'm sure you know this, Sue, I'm looking at Sue when she's been reading it all all week. Um, <laughs> the state figures are, are the ones reported by the state for reimbursement by the federal government. So uh, th the GAO says a lot of states don't even submit. So we're only getting their Wait, estimates. why wouldn't they submit? They don't get reimbursement for illegal, uh, illegal aliens? They get it, but sometimes, you know, who knows? I don't think they get that much. of It's not a huge All part right, of so the budget. All right, so what does the reimbursement issue have to do with the lack of numbers? I didn't follow that. The, the GAO collects the state prison numbers from the states themselves. Got that. At least when I looked, the majority of states weren't even submitting those numbers. Okay, you so get a I got small, I, all right. Why do they submit at all? A all right. small amount of reimbursement. Um, and even there, what the states are doing so is asking. Uh -huh. <laughs> they ask, are you a citizen? And right, that's and you what, can say anything. You can say anything. Um, they also, in one case, I forget which it is, I believe in the state cases, they count um, only, Ill yeah, of course, state cases only count illegal immigrants. In federal, they count both legal and illegal. And I want both, and I think any citizen should want both. I mean, it's bad enough to have right, criminals but we running want them across separated, our border. But we want specific yeah, but, but numbers. Yeah, but I want to know how yes. many are legal. What's it, who's By our the government way, letting I, in? I, I have to tell you, your question is awesome, the, the one you highlighted. This is another one. I, I have a ser I'm gonna. I'm writing a column that it, I'm just working on it. It'll it'll come out. I don't know when. Questions to ask folks in your family and friends on the left. Non non aggressive. They're not aggressive questions. Like if if a, if a person believes that in 12 years the Earth life on Earth will be threatened with destruction by seas overwhelming coasts, would you keep or sell your coastal property? <laughs> is that a fair question? No, 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 no not, I, I'm not. Yes, right. I get, yes. So the next one is, would you or would you not like data mm -hmm. 
on whether or not anyone arrested by the police is an illegal immigrant or not. Right. Do you want the number? Should the yes, government count? That's right. No, they shouldn't count. How dare you? <laughs> no, but, but it, it's an astonishing thing. Yep. That's If that's not proof, I get flack on occasion. You know, people, uh, you know, I, I read comments on my columns. I find them totally illuminating and fascinating <laughs> and uh, including the cursing me out. Every, right. It's just, it's just fascinating to me. It's a window into America. Yeah. And uh, Prager says that the left is for open borders. But of course they're for open borders. Mm -hmm. You don't have to use the word to say that you're for open borders. But this is a perfect example of it. If you're not for open borders, then you wouldn't you want to know the rate of crime right. among illegal pe people coming in here illegally? On the open borders point... Um, it just occurred to me when you're saying that, because you hear the Democrats saying this all the time, too. We're not for open borders. You always hear people say that. Look, words are not always all-encompassing or, you know, perfectly exclusive of the outliers. I mean, I think they are for open borders. But beyond that, this is like the old, remember during the Cold War, what do you mean communism? And so, you know, you're stuck in a debate for 45 minutes on what communism... That's no. right. It's not really communist. I, yes. call, it, uh, sure. I call it the, the right. left's um, scorched earth policy of argumentation. They retreat, burning the English language as they go. So we can never <laughs> actually talk about anything. We'll be back in a moment. <laughs> With the non laconic and Coulter. <laughs> the Dennis Prager Show. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here. 1 8 Prager 776. There's no question, and I, and I don't say this off, I don't know if I've maybe said it once before, and I don't even recall if I did. I could have a three hour show with you, uh, and it, nobody would be bored. You, folks, you have to understand something. Uh, she is a firebrand, says some wild stuff, but is a brilliant woman. This is a knowledgeable, brilliant woman. Uh, and there is no reason I have, I have uh, she doesn't hire me. She didn't pay me. I don't work for her. We're not in conjunction. <laughs> uh, she likes my wife more than me. I mean, I, I have no personal interest in this. <laughs> And I am sitting here beaming, which you cannot see on radio. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, we're talking about what is really now, this is brand new to me, my dear friends. It's not new to Ann Coulter, but it is new to me, and I admit it, I never realized how much cover-up is being done. You talk about deep state. This is, an, this is yes. people say, what is deep state? When your government has vast numbers of people in it working against your society. That is a deep state. Well, that's why Trump won, and that's why his presidency has been, in many ways, so disappointing. Um, I mean, that, There we differ. I think it's been magnificent. Okay, on immigration. Now, oh, oh, oh. I was going to say... <laughs> that's an important little... Okay. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that's I agree with you. It has been disappointing on immigration. But... For I mean, the, the defense on a certain conservative network is always, oh, it's not his fault. It's not his fault. It's Paul Ryan. It's Mitch McConnell. Oh, he's being – it's – oh, his staff at the White House. Well, who hired them? Um, and no, I'm sorry. That's no excuse. Trump ran against Paul Ryan. He ran against Mitch McConnell. He ran against both Republicans and Democrats. They all hated him. Remember, every time he'd take a great stand on immigration, Paul Ryan would be, and McConnell would rush out and say, that's not who we are. I mean, there has never been such... People talk about this or that president having a mandate. There has never been such a ringing endorsement for a specific mandate, and it was on immigration because we've been betrayed by both Democrats and Republicans for so many years. With other elections, even Reagan, with the with the with Russia, um, the Soviet Union, the evil empire, that was important. Cutting taxes was important, but also he seems like a decent man. He had been governor of California. You know, a big argument was California would be the sixth largest economy in the world if it were a country. Um, he seems like a competent manager and a decent person. Let's give him a shot. You can't really say the, I mean, you, you didn't have, even Bush, um, the first Bush was a terrible president. Okay, he was Reagan's vice president. We feel like he learned something. He was head of the CIA. With Trump, he wasn't head of the CIA. He wasn't governor of California. He wasn't vice president to the greatest president we've ever had. He comes out of nowhere. So the fact that he won 
makes his mandate the clearest bell the American people have ever rung on a mandate. They have never reached so far to have a mandate as to put this man in the Oval Office. It's not just that he said it every day at every campaign speech. It's that, All right, so why fine. else were you voting for okay, him? Okay, fair enough. It is, it is a, a fair and passionate, both, both are true, that it's fair and passionate. So the question is, in your mind, since he has been so magnificent, in my opinion, on, on many so, other things, uh, right? Exactly. Well, that's and what's, gutsy, right? What happened here? Um, one thing in defense of people like like me and all of us who ferociously supported Trump, because some of my some of my friends who never, I mean, you know, some of them like Heather McDonald, and <laughs> they're smart. I love them. They always hated Trump. Said he's a liar and a con man. And I said I don't wait. Care. Heather McDonald. She's uh, I I love Heather. She's and brilliant. she does magnificent work. I I never talked to her about Trump. So I you see. Yes. Okay. Too. I don't care though because either did I she or doesn't do I. write against him. She's not using her the power uh, that I. She, I, I she's not. She's not silly. I mean, her complaints are are perfectly fine, legitimate. Right. Let me put it that way. But her, but the idea for the, now not she, but you know people like her. I was just citing someone well known. So that would be many of my friends coming back. You know now and saying we told you, we told you. No, 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 no. In my defense and in defense of all Trump supporters, in a far more complicated area, the judiciary. Trump has been better than any president in my lifetime, probably since the history of the republic. Why? Because he, of course he doesn't know what he's doing. He farmed it out to the Federalist Society. Why didn't he farm out immigration so to I'm Chris So I'm asking Kobach? you, okay, that's what, why? do you why? have a why? theory? Do you have a theory on it? Back in a moment, Dennis Prager with Ann Cole. The Dennis Prager Show. Okay, everybody, Dennis Prager here with Ann Coulter. And I, I, you know, I'm telling you, we could do a marathon session. I know we should. Yes. I think sometime this, uh, in the summer, I think we should do something like that. It goes really fast. It goes really fast. And uh, you, do you know I have a theory? You'll like this, Anne. Because mm-hmm. I, 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 I've always looked at myself from outside myself. And I realize why I'm interesting. Because if you're not interesting, you can't do this work. I right, mean, that, that, right. That, that's, that's, it's just like you can't, you can't you can't have shaky hands if you're a surgeon. Okay. <laughs> and the, I think one of the reasons is it's not the only is I get bored so quickly. Yes, me too. That I would bore me. Yes, yes, yes. So you resonate to that. That's how I write. My books, if I have to read them over and over that, and over yes, again. Yes, it's a bad sign. If, if I'm not laughing oh, that's and great. enjoying yes. this, right. I, I force my friends like Robert here to read chapters. How do I lure oh, Robert, them into he, it? He complains to me every week. I, I get email know. from, I can't believe it. Not I'm enough jokes in, uh, in this one. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no. Get to the so point, Missy. When, with you, that, my point, though, was not to talk about me. It was to use me as an example. But that, that, with you, it is not an issue. What you say is important and interesting. You have thought it through. This issue of why the president did not use his power in the Congress the first two years on the issue for which he was elected more than any other right. is a riddle. Yes, yes, it is. And I wanted you to ask me this so I could say one other thing about it before we moved on to the next topic. Um, although I can't, I can't precisely say why, why I can say how, and that is by bringing in an entire White House staff that are either idiots, patsies, or most often actively hostile to Trump's agenda. Um, so what needs to be done going forward, that I can tell you is a fact. What what happened in the past, I can only speculate about. He needs to fire the kids. Um, Jared Kushner was telling journalists back during the campaign when they were asking, well, what, you're working for your father-in-law's campaign and you're a liberal Democrat. He assured them all, you know my father-in-law, he's not going to build a wall. So this has become a talisman for, for the left that, you know, we can, we can count on Jared and Ivanka. They're going to block the wall. Mick Mulvaney, huge amnesty supporter. You heard, I assume, I'm, I was hanging on every word and couldn't, could barely get anything done this week, how um, the Angel Moms went to Washington this week to oppose the bill. They go to Capitol Hill. They, they talk to some Democrats. They go to the White House. No room at the inn. Mick Mulvaney told the Angel Moms, no, you cannot see Trump before he signs this bill because we're afraid if he sees dead kids, he won't sign the bill. 
um, the angel mom started to plan a protest outside the White House. And who called and screamed at them? How dare you do this to the president? Mercedes Schlapp and Kellyanne Conway. If you are going to surround yourself with people who oppose your agenda, I, I mean, that's why I'm contrasting it with the judiciary when, oh, come on, Trump didn't know Brett Kavanaugh walked the face of the earth. And yet he makes this magnificent appointment because he delegated to people who do know and who agree with his agenda. There are plenty of people to hire Chris so Kobach, Chris turn, Kobach, Chris really, Kobach. Then in that case, and in light of the fact that people can't get data, I'm starting to realize this is the issue of the day. And you were right all these years. Thank this, you. this is yes, no, it's true. And, and I always had, I always agreed, but I didn't realize that this is the the barometer right. of, of the society and divides the non yes. the new Repu- yes. Trumpian Republican Party from the old tax cuts. What do you need? Wall By the way, Street? A, a, on behalf of of the uh, of the woman we both love. I want to ask you a question. <laughs> do you, how important do you think E-Verify is in solving this problem? It's important, but I don't count on it because I promise you it will be it will be undermined. That was one of the surprising things I found out when I wrote Adios Mary. What happened to all the promises with Reagan's amnesty? Well, the main promise he made wasn't a wall back then, although there were going to be barriers and we're going to defend the board. The main promise is we are going to be pedal to the metal with employer sanctions. And guess which party came in and dismantled them? Not the Starts Democrats. With an R. So when you have both the Republican Party and the Democrats and all the rich saying, no, we want to hire cheap, illegal alien labor. Yes, I think we ought to force E-Verify as long as Trump is president. But it's go it's going to be like footprints in the sand. A wall is forever. Only a wall is forever. I have another deep concern, the, the Central Park uh, murders. But I, I uh, this is too important to me. I want to take a call. Dion in, uh, in uh, Chicago. Hi, you're on with Ann Coulter and Dennis Prager. One, two, three, four, eighty. Uh oh. Dion is not. Uh, yep. Dion, you're on the air. Dion, you're on Hello. the radio. Dion, Dion. this is Dennis Prager. Can you hear me? We're waiting. Can you hear me? We've been waiting for you, Dion. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, I can, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, let me take you off the speaker. Hold on one second. I'm going to take you off. Hello? All right, okay, Dion, if you talk, call a radio show. you got to be ready to talk. That it's all just a little bit of history repeating. There are so many good calls. I, this really buttresses my argument for three hours with Ann Coulter. I've never done it, but I think we should. I mean, here I am saying it publicly. And we just picked up a few new topics that we didn't, we weren't no, no, able no, to get there, to there in are, this there hour. Are so many. Anyway, I want to know about your next cookbook. You said you're writing a cookbook. <laughs> and you know, me and my listeners were just uh, <laughs> cooking well, is a big thing on my show. <laughs> I was, as you may be aware, very depressed when Trump signed this bill. I think it really puts him in a very difficult position to, to use inherent powers of the president to build the wall, which he has always had, to declare the emergency. Well, having just signed a bill, <laughs> he has to go to the court and say, it's an emergency that I not follow this bill that says that I can't build a wall on the border and so on and so forth. He didn't want to close the government. It's clear. That was the issue He could have asked him. for a continuing resolution, et cetera, right. et cetera. Okay. But All right. I will me, say yeah. – um, I, di- I did practice law for a while, and one of the phenomenon of being a, a lawyer is you get handed some crap-ass case, and you're thinking, my client is totally in the wrong. This is a loser, a dog of a case. Why are you giving this to me? I'm going to lose. I'm going to lose. And then you start writing your arguments, and you convince yourself. And by the time you're presenting your brief, you're just full of righteous anger. How could any court disagree with me? Nothing has changed. You've just convinced yourself. I will probably end up doing that on the emergency order, but I want to tell you it that in the clear light of day, <laughs> by the way, I think you know, he's really screwed you, himself. You want an example of a lawyer who has the exact situation you just described? Smollett's lawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That is, I was sure you were just going to say, and let me give you an example. I mean, <laughs> if a man has been given a losing case, <laughs> it is like defending right. John Wilkes Booth. Right. <laughs> Right. What? One of them already quit. One of them already quit? <laughs> Since the show began. All right, look, we're going to. All right, you're back for the issue because this is very important. 
about uh, the Central the Park Central rape Park, that Trump yes. is absolutely right on. He was so courageous during the campaign. Bring that Trump back. Fire the White House staff. He is. He, he is. He's still courageous. He makes mistakes. He's human. He's he's been extraordinary. And so are you. And uh, it. And let me just say, folks, uh, Mike, Chuck, Dennis, Gregory, Ray, Mike, Barry and Andre. By the way, does Mike and Glendora know Mike and El Segundo? You know, all the Mikes. You're both Prager listeners. You'd have a lot to talk about. They would, in fact. Folks, forgive me for not getting to your calls, but we're going to review this subject again. And, Anne, what's the latest book? I want people to read everything you wrote. Resistance is Futile, How the Trump-Hating Left Lost Its Collective Mind. Bless you. Keep writing. See you tomorrow, everybody. I'm Dennis Prager. The Dennis Prager Show, live from the Relief Factor Pain-Free Studio. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. And meanwhile, controversy continues over President Trump's border wall. Democrats continue to fringe themselves by claiming that all walls are bad. All they have to claim here is that President Trump's border wall is not the best expenditure of money. All they have to do is say, like, let's put up fencing in certain areas. We don't need a 2,000 mile border wall. Let's strengthen security at different points of entry. Let's let's work on a variety of other ways to, to shut down illegal immigration. Instead, Democrats have decided that they think because people don't like Trump generally, because Trump is not super popular, that that means that Americans are in favor of the most radical version of the open borders argument. This argument was presented by the venerable, fresh-faced, so fresh, so face, AOC on Instagram over the weekend. She says that our border wall and the the wall Trump wants to build, it's just like the Berlin Wall, which makes perfect sense if you smacked your head on a stoop when you were three. No matter how you feel about about the wall, you know, I think it's a moral abomination. I think it's like the Berlin Wall. Okay, if you think that a wall to keep people out is the same as a wall to keep people in, then that's just dumb. That is a dumb thing. It is a very dumb thing. This is like saying that the wall of your house is exactly like the wall of the local penitentiary, except, except it isn't. The, the wall of the local jail is precisely created to keep criminals out of general society. The wall around your house is created to keep criminals out of your home. What One wall is created to keep people in. The other is to cre- create it to keep people out. Like, wh- why is this difficult in any way? I don't understand. If we were building a wall that were forcing people to stay in America, yeah, that's like the Berlin Wall. It turns out that people were not trying to get through the Berlin Wall from west to east Germany. They were trying to get through the Berlin Wall from east to west Germany. The Soviets were shooting people trying to leave East Germany. So when we start shooting people trying to leave America, by the way, that seems more in line with socialist thinking, right? Socialist thinking is that if you make a lot of money in the United States, then we should grab your money, force you to stay here, and then tax the living crap out of you. And if you try to leave, we should punish you. It's much more in line with left thinking to build walls that keep people in than with right thinking. Walls on the, walls on the right, for better or for worse, tend to be built to keep people out. Sometimes that's really bad. Sometimes it's not. Walls on the left tend to be built to keep people in. That is always really bad, invariably really bad. In any case, the wall continues to be a hot button issue. The Trump administration is not making the world's strongest case for the national emergency declaration that President Trump announced last Friday. Again, I don't think the president had to make that national emergency declaration. I think he had the capacity under 10 U.S.C. 284 to declare that there were drug corridors existing along the U.S.-Mexico border that required the building of additional fencing. He doesn't need to declare a national emergency to do that. Instead, he declared a national emergency. And that created a real problem for the administration because they now have to explain why this is not a wild violation of precedent. That any time you can't get a congressional deal on the table, you just declare a national emergency and then get the funding however you want. This is very much akin to Barack Obama not being able to get an immigration deal and then unilaterally declaring that he was not going to enforce immigration law. Chris Wallace made this very clear when he was interviewing Stephen Miller. He said, like, I'm going to need an instance of a president who declared a national emergency to redirect funding after failing to negotiate a deal with Congress. Can you name one case where a president has asked Congress for money, Congress has refused, and the president has then invoked national powers to get the money anyway? Well, this current situation... Yes or no, sir. The current situation pertains specifically to the military construction authority. I'm just asking, has there been a single case where Congress asked for money for military construction, Congress said no, and he then... The meaning of the statute, Chris, is clear on its own terms. If you don't like the statute, or members of Congress don't like the statute, would you agree the answer is no? There hasn't been 
know, some of those things like this. Ago. Okay, so what Miller is saying is not wrong, right? I mean, there is an arguable case that you can declare a national emergency and use these various methodologies in order to spend money on the border. That's arguable, at least. What Wallace is saying is, is not arguable. What Wallace is saying is that there is not a history of presidents failing at congressional negotiation and then simply declaring a national emergency to get the, the money that they want. So this is going to continue to be a hot button political issue. It'll be held up in court for sure. The chances that President Trump builds any substantial portion of the wall before his reelect effort in 2020 is extraordinarily low, especially because, as I mentioned last week, the budget that he signed itself on its own terms prohibits the spending of money outside of border wall in the Rio Grande Valley. So it's it's a real legal conundrum for the Trump administration. With that said, is it a political victory for the Trump administration? Certainly it is with, with Trump's base. And again, if Democrats continue to double down on all border walls are bad, that's going to be a problem for them. And Democrats are going to continue to double down on that because Democrats running in 2020 have to run to the left. This is why even Sherrod Brown, who's considered more moderate 2020 possible Democratic candidate, he was asked about tearing down existing wall. And, and the reason he was asked about this is because Beto O'Rourke from El Paso, dude, he was asked last week, if you don't like walls so much, why not tear down the wall between the United States and Mexico in El Paso, where you're from? And he said, well, maybe I will. You never know. And then he smoked out of a really large bong. Well, Sherrod Brown, the senator from Ohio, he was asked about this. He says, well, I don't know. Maybe I will. Maybe I will. And maybe I won't. I don't really know. Well, let's talk about it. Do you think the existing walls and fencing along the border should come down? ICE take a backseat to nobody in border security. And it's clear we've learned over time that we have the technology, helicopters, uh, border agents to make our country safe and to keep to keep illegal crossings at a minimum uh, without building a long wall. Uh, that's a decision that should be made in the whole context. You don't say, well, this congressman says take it down here. This congressman says build it mm -hmm. up there. You really want to look look more broadly. Than OK, that. that's what we call avoiding the question because he doesn't want to get on the wrong side of the AOC base. It's not just Sherrod Brown doing this routine. It's Kirsten Gillibrand, she of the thousand positions. She has never taken a position on any issue, and this issue is no exception. She was asked if she could support removing barriers, and here's what she had to say. A proposal from Beto O'Rourke to actually remove some of the existing wall. He was talking about El Paso, but the idea of dismantling some of the wall, good idea, bad idea? Well, I'd have to ask uh, folks in that part of the, uh, of the country to see whether the fencing that exists today is helpful or unhelpful. Um, but, you know, Democrats are not afraid of national security or border security. Um, Democrats have funded border security for decades. So I could look at it and see which part he means and why. And if it makes sense, I could support it. OK, she took three positions in the space of 30 seconds right there. It's unbelievable. She, she's, she's gifted. I mean, I'll, I'll give her this. It's, li it's like, d it, have you ever seen one of those films where there's a strobe light in the film and suddenly people are sort of flashing from one place to another? That's basically her on positions. She just kind of moves from position to position. In, that, in the space of that 30 seconds, she said, we can ask the locals. Also, we're great on border security. Also, maybe we should take down the wall. Kirsten Gillibrand, man. You, you, gotta, you gotta admire the, the absolute confidence with which she says three conflicting things in the space of 30 seconds. But again, all Democrats are afraid of being outflanked on their left, and that is why they are embracing the Beto position that maybe, maybe we should consider tearing down existing border walls, which is just insane. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Senya Villarreal, executive producer Jeremy Boring, senior producer Jonathan Hay.